Hello and welcome to this repair tutorial and today we're going to look at a Denon PMA 350 SE amplifier. So general specifications, um, not, not bad, it's a 50 watts per channel into 8 ohms and uh, if you choose then to fit 4 ohm speakers that uh, increases then to 80 watts. And then frequency response is 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz and excellent total harmonic distortion of 0.05%. And input sensitivity is 150 millivolts for all of the line inputs. This amplifier had the option to have a plug-in uh, moving magnet for phono stroke turntable connection. But sometimes it can be a little bit confusing, but it's actually coming in on the AUX1 uh, selection. And that's where it would normally be connected. But this amplifier that came in the workshop didn't have the phono board installed. And then... It also supported a remote control as well. So you can just sort of see on the video for the picture here, there's a small little IR port and the remote control really performed two functions. It performed the operation of the volume control to raise and lower. And you could also place the amplifier into mute. So this is where the speaker protection relays just de-energize and that would be indicated on the front panel. But please note that input selection is not via an integrated circuit and it is still conventional manual selection via a multi-pin switch. And the amplifier also had a headphone socket and a single balance control. So from the tone control circuit, you didn't, for example, have independent treble and bass. That was not an option here. And then for weight, you're looking at 6.2 kilograms and dimensions is 434 width, 120 by for height and then 286 millimeters depth so what was the issue with this amplifier when it came into the workshop well the first thing sort of to note was that if you powered the amplifier up um, please note that there is no internal startup circuit so it doesn't require for example a microprocessor to initialize a startup relay that then puts power onto the toroidal this amplifier uses a conventional ENI type transformer, a pretty good spec, but the power to it is via the front push button or, or front panel switch. So no LED indication that the amplifier was powering up. So of course, normal things that you would check is the incoming main supply and the fuse within the plug, and then also the protection fuse on the board. And all is fine. And the only thing that then remained is just to check the primary of the transformer and what was found was that it was open circuit now I'm not telling you that this is common but I do see you know amplifiers of this time period with this type of fault now trying to source a replacement transformer for this unit and the year that it was manufactured is going to be impossible so what I hold in stock is just a range of toroidal transformers so the specification for this transformer and again I'm showing this in the video is 33-33 volts so and then at 150 VA rating now what I also have are mounting plates so when you remove the EI transformer you'll need to use a mounting plate unless of course you drill through the the case but what I have is mounting plates and then there's also an anti-skid mat which is common with the toroidal transformers and then on these transformers which are made it has a center fixing bolt and then I can then connect the transformer directly to the mounting plate. And then the holes which are drilled into the mounting plate match exactly the footprint for the original Denon PMA 350 transformer. So I'm showing this in the video because what I've done is I've removed the main amplifier board. And that again is easy enough to do. There's two screws underneath which screw into the heatsink. And once you remove the back panel, it's only a case of some screws then top left and right which hold the front fascia in place and then approximately four screws underneath and then the complete assembly really will then come away so it makes it very easy to install this transformer now because it is heavy what I've done is I've used uh, screws which come through the bottom so they're threaded through the original mounting holes and then what I do is I just use the washers then to lock it into place onto the footprint of the plate and then I use uh, locking nuts on top of that. And there's no way that that transformer, you know, is going to move even if it was in transit or even vibration or anything like that over time. So once that was done, the next thing 
here was really just to take up some sort of remedial work to ensure that when I'm in the test phase, um, you know, there's no sort of underlying issues. So the first one, of course, is the input selection switch. And what I've done for this video is I'll show you the before and then the, the after. So what you have, uh, the mechanical arrangement from the front, and these are what we call ribbon type switches. So there is a metal spring steel uh, ribbon that comes back and then it then clips onto a plastic mounting plate. And then inside of there, you'll just see like a lever. And then as you rotate the switch backwards and forwards, it will move the actuation of the switch. And then the contacts will slide along the switch. Over time, you'll get this oxidization and also resistance. So the customer may report that you have intermittent sound loss or even if it was maybe a phono input, you can often get low level distortion because of the resistance and then the low level millivolts attributed to that type of input. Straightforward to repair this. So once you unclip the top actuator lever from the main body of the switch, look at the main circuit board and just desolder it. And then you can remove it and then just take a small pair of pliers. I tend to use just some uh, older um, side cutters because I can just bend the the actual sort of um, they're almost like metal tabs and then once I've done that I can then just withdraw the switch assembly and you can see how heavily oxidized it is I also show in the video something which I often refer to and these are these fiberglass pencils so you can order these uh, readily available and then you use the fiberglass pencil just be careful to wear some sort of maybe rubber gloves and some eye protection and then you can just move it backwards and forwards around over the contacts and that will remove any oxidization and then I also coat it then with a slip lubricant which is a deoxy type just to provide that longevity and then reassemble the switch then if it's something that you're undertaking for this first time I would always advise you just to take some photographs so you know how the switch gets reassembled what I tend to do is I'll just actuate the switch fully to the right or to the left so I know its position and then I'll then do the strip down but remember when you reassemble just to verify that you have full range before you close back the metal tabs and then you can then install the switch back into the circuit board and, and that will be fine the other thing that I'm checking as well are the rear speaker protection relays and again I show this in the video it's really just coming back to the age of the amplifier and how much it had been used and these relays really are inexpensive so they're 24 volt uh, double pole changeover and as I show you you can just order these and then just replace them then and that just takes away any issues future where maybe you have intermittent loss of sound or distortion because you had relay contacts which were then worn. What I also show in the video as well are the main sanking outputs uh, because this amplifier can deliver 80 watts into a 4 ohm speaker load it's always nice to see these higher power sanking devices so you can see that there's a 2SD 2401 and then the 2SB 1570. Now I've never seen uh, one of these PMA uh, amplifiers come into the workshop with blown outputs, never once. They always seem to be extremely substantial um, and sometimes maybe over spec'd and provide extremely you know, long service. You'll also see that I take the time then to inspect that main circuit board as well and I always refer to this you'll always have some kind of dry joint or even just cracks around some of the solder connections normally where you have stress points so I highlight also the balance control potentiometer when it comes into the board you'll always find maybe some cracks around there so I've just shown you here that it's been reflowed and I mentioned this before on other tutorials also have a look at the headphone socket that is a very very common area where you'll get cracks and breaks because of the mechanical stress so I just take the time just to check all the input RCA type sockets resolder anything which looks suspect you know don't rush that but if it's again first time you're doing it just take your time make sure you don't get any solder bridges and once that is then done I'm in the position then where I can reassemble the amplifier um, what you'll also notice as well I'm showing in the video the underneath of the amplifier and you can see the, the the mounting feet or the feet on the plate on these series of amplifiers it was almost like a rubberized type cushion uh, which fits on to the mounting feet you'll often find that these are missing or maybe one or two of them what I have in stock are just some of these felt feet um, 
and I've just replaced them then. So when the customer installs it maybe onto a unit, it's not going to scratch the surface, or equally so if they then put it onto another device in their stack system, again, no risk of damage or anything like that. So what I'm now showing is the uh, actual schematic or, or the extract then from the service manual which shows the power transformer and I'm highlighting here that the power transformer failure was due to the thermal fuse going open circuit. Now this transformer is just dual winding it's not what we would tend to term more so as like a multi-type or multi-tap transformer. From a repair point of view it makes it much easier for yourselves if you're going to make a repair because it's more difficult on some amplifiers where you have multiple tapping points so maybe it has the main power output so in this case as we said it was 33 0 33 but then if you add secondary wires like maybe 0 15 or 0 23 0 23 for other parts of the circuit that can make it a little bit more difficult to source so you shouldn't have any issues sourcing a toroidal type transformer with a 150 VA rating at 36 volts. Once it comes in it's then been rectified you'll find that the rectification voltage if you're using a 33 not 33 will be slightly higher than what's quoted here which is about 43 volts. I've used that because I have it in stock and there's enough headroom within the circuit to cope with that. Even if you fitted for example a 30 dash 30 it would be more than enough. And then what the designers have done is they take the main uh, rectify voltage that applies then to the output stage and then what they've then done is they feed it then to the low voltage power supply and what you have is what we call series regulator circuits and then that provides the uh, it's approximately 15.9 volts plus or minus then to the um, pre-amplifier and then input selection circuits as well so not very very complicated here and as I said there is no sort of startup power supply and then moving on, what I also show is the alignment. Now, it's important if you replace the toroidal transformer here that you need to do this adjustment. So because this transformer was slightly higher than what, what was originally fitted, once the amplifier was run up under test, the millivoltage for the bias current is slightly higher than what you would expect. So it should be set to 10 millivolts. When I did the initial test, it was probably about 18 millivolts, so not hugely high, but it did need adjustment. So what the service manual will refer to is the initial setting. So it's OK, when you first power up the amplifier, just adjust the preset potentiometers, as I'm highlighting here. And remember what I'm showing is the extract for the left channel. Right channel is the same. And you adjust that you know, to nominal. I tend to just go underneath what the requirement is, so I'll probably take it down to about 8 millivolts. And then I'll leave the amplifier for about 10 to 15 minutes then just to warm up. I said this before, you don't have it in a drafty environment, have a you know sort of stable ambient temperature. And then what I then do is I do the final adjustment. So you can see that the test connector is mounted on the board as highlighted, and that is uh, measuring the millivoltage directly across the two uh, emitter resistors as shown in the circuit here. And these are 0.22 ohm 3 watt times 2. And I just make the final adjustment then to 10 millivolts. As I've said in other tutorials, it's always prudent just to spray some deoxid or high quality contact cleaner onto the presets before you do the adjustment with the power off and just move them backwards and forwards just to clean the carbon track and the contact wiper. Sometimes they can get, you know, sort of dirty and you get issues trying to set the bias uh, current for the output stage then. So once that was then done, and again, just to highlight, you don't want to connect any speakers when you're doing that, and your balance control would be set to minimum, no input signal, and also as well, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, as I said, no input signal, no speakers connected, volume control at minimum, and then balance control then at center point. So really not a sophisticated repair um, for people out there. If you have this issue, you know, first thing always to check is the power transformer but uh, hopefully you know you've, you've got a bit of insight here and if you need any help or assistance repairing an amplifier so we say by all means email audio amplifier servicing at aol.com and I'll be more than happy to respond back to you and provide any guidance or assistance that you may require so thanks very much for stopping by and I appreciate you listening today and I wish you all the best until the next time cheers
Bye-bye.